never done that before. Hey guys, Alex here with Armadillo Armament. Today, we are going to be discussing my primary weapon system, the Sig Sauer MCX Virtus, the generation two that has fallen a little bit behind with the new generation uh, Spear LT coming up. And I want people to realize this is still a very viable option, as well as I want to give you guys my further opinions on this after another couple thousand rounds. I am near about 10,000 rounds on this rifle. And my optic setup and general setup has actually changed quite a bit as well. So I'll be bringing you through that as well. Now, before we jump into the video, you can support me by buying patches. If you use code armadillo, you'll get 5% off your order and I'll get a small kickback. It is armadillos with MCXs and quad nods. Doesn't get any cooler than that. Uh, for every single item in that order, my vendor is going to be removing one pound of junk from the ocean as well as planting a tree. So you're not only buying a really cool patch, you're saving the planet. So let's talk about the MCX. Now let's talk about my history with the MCX first. Uh, this was one of the first videos on my YouTube channel talking about my primary weapon system, which this very much is. Um, it is uh, shockingly a pretty good video still. I highly recommend you go watch it. Music's a little bit loud in it, but um, for one of my first videos, I'm still strangely proud of it. Um, now, my MCX has changed quite a bit over time, so what I'm going to be doing is telling you about my experiences, and then we'll get into my overall setup. But I'm going to bring you through uh, from the top of the rifle to the bottom of the rifle, basically everything that you see here, in case you have any questions, right? So... Uh, first things first is, uh, in my opinion, the heart of the rifle. Uh, many people would call that the barrel, and that's understandable, but the heart of the rifle for me kind of is the optic setup, because the optic setup uh, really does tell you what you're going to be doing with the rifle, or rather, you tell the rifle what it's going to be doing. If you are running a 1 to 6 LPVO uh, on a, even an 11.5, it's going to be pretty good at close range, but you're really focusing more on that mid to long range accuracy. An ACOG is a mid range optic, so you're going to be focusing on mid range accuracy. This EOTech and G45 clearly positions itself as a short range night vision rifle. So that is one of the largest differences I have in my modern setup of my MCX compared to what I've previously run. I have run a Vortex Razor HD Gen 2, as well as I run an ACOG on both a 16 inch and an 11.5. Um, but similar to last video, this rifle is a 11.5 inch barrel. So from here to here, 11.5 inches. Um, and once again, going back up to the optic setup, we have an EOTech EXPS. It is the single dot version on a Unity riser with a G45 magnifier on a Unity riser. And that is going to uh, be a flip to center mount. So it's not going to flip to the side like a normal magnifier. It's instead going to flip up and down. And the reason for that is, once again, this is a night vision gun. So to continue talking about the optics, this EXPS is here because it is, generally speaking, the best night vision uh, optic on the planet. The window on the EXPS is absolutely massive. Getting behind it with my RNVGs right here is very easy, uh, and it is a holographic reticle, which has its own benefits, which we'll get into. A T2, which is another optic you will find on a night vision rifle or a shorter rifle like this, T2s are phenomenal, right? Same with uh, the new uh, MRO HD, as well as many other rifles, comps from Aimpoint, um, those are all fantastic optics. However, the EOTech really sets itself apart in a couple ways. First of all, the massive window is going to make it so getting behind the optic is very easy. But second of all, uh, it is a holographic reticle, and it's not just an LED projection. So behind a G45 magnifier like this, the reticle is going to maintain the same size because of the way it projects onto your eye. Now, that's very important because when you're looking through a T2, even a 1MOA T2, uh, I think it's 2 MOA, actually. Uh, that dot is going to increase significantly under a magnifier, and it's still perfectly usable, but I want this rifle to be primarily a close-range rifle with the capability of stretching its legs. That's why I have the G45, and 
I've spent too much time talking about this already. I'm not going to continue telling you about the G45 benefits um, because I will be having a review on the near future about this, but the G45 and the EOTech setup really match the MCX 11.5 very well, which I think is my favorite barrel length for the MCX. This started life as the patrol version, which means it's the 16 inch long handguard version. I cut it down to 11.5 and the next thing we're going to be talking about, the other parts of the rifle is going to be the rail in the barrel. So like I mentioned, this is a 11.5 inch barrel. What that means is I cut from 16 to 11.5, but I also had to change my handguard, which is very important. People complain about the MCX handguard a lot. Um, they say that it's way too thick. It's uh, hard to get a proper hold on it. And, um, you know, they're not completely incorrect. Uh, if you have large hands like me, uh, it's really a non-issue. But Midwest Industries makes this rail right here that is significantly skinnier than a normal MCX rail. And I'll be having pictures on the screen of what that looks like, the original MCX rail. This rail is a lot thinner, which means I can very easily kind of C-clamp this rifle. If I go back here, and actually, let's remove that sling just so you guys can see everything better. It's a little sling holder from T-Rex Arms. I highly recommend them. But I can very easily C-clamp this rifle, and that's over a tape switch. My fingers can actually almost touch there. Um, so the rail is a lot skinnier, and the barrel was cut down to uh, make it a more maneuverable platform until I get a suppressor. Then the suppressor is really going to increase the length by quite a bit. But now it's time to talk about the barrel, uh, the other most important part of the rifle. Like I mentioned, this is a 11.5 barrel, and this is the Virtus. Uh, so the original Gen 1 MCX had a pencil barrel, and many people really disagreed with that. A pencil barrel is just a much thinner barrel. But what that's going to uh, unfortunately have is significantly high, uh, higher heat after, let's say, like one or two magazines. And a uh, hotter barrel is going to shoot worse groups and obviously be significantly hotter, as well as the barrel life can potentially be uh, less on those lighter barrels. Um, SIG knew that this was an issue that many people were complaining about, so uh, they kind of... <laughs> They kind of jumped the shark a little bit, and they instead instead of going to like a more reasonable medium contour barrel, they went to a extremely heavy contour barrel. Funny enough, um, now I really appreciate that uh, the MCX Virtus barrel is comically thick. It's very hard for me to show you, but it's almost as thick as my muzzle device. Um, I jokingly say it's almost like an LMG barrel because it really is. <laughs> it is a extremely thick barrel profile that has a lot of benefits and that is going to be, uh, first of all, heat. It's not going to heat up nearly as quickly. It's going to maintain its accuracy for far longer. Barrel length may potentially be longer if you're, you know, if you're shooting a very high uh, round count uh, on the regular, a pencil barrel is gonna wear a lot thinner. Um, and a heavy barrel is also going to be really heavy, which has its own benefits and its own, draw its own drawbacks. Uh, a heavier barrel, a barrel is one of the heaviest components on your rifle. Uh, if you've ever taken a barrel out of a out of the box, a six inch barrel, you're like, wow, that is a lot of weight. It doesn't, you don't feel like it will be, but barrels are very heavy. This barrel makes the rifle very front heavy. And I'd say my rifle is pretty well balanced right now. See? if I balance it on one hand. However, even still, uh, the barrel is very heavy and it keeps the muzzle down, which I'll be further speaking to later. But 11.5 barrel, it is one of my favorite barrel lengths. 11.5 uh, in a recent Grantham video, but this has been seen all over. 11.5 actually has some of the highest velocity increases when you're going like just an inch at a time. So from 10.3 to 11.5, you're getting more than 100 feet per second just by moving up that little bit, that inch, that 1.2 inches. Now moving up from uh, 11.5 to 12.5, it's going to be a lot less. So 11.5 also has significantly better dwell time, which means it's not going to be eating your parts alive. Um, and for those couple reasons, which I will have more expanded video on at some point, 11.5, in my opinion, is the best SBR barrel length. Uh, I really recommend it if you're looking for a shorty, but you're not looking to go 10.3 and just a rifle that's going to eat itself alive. 11.5 is the way to go, which is why I cut my barrel.
all right? And that's why SIG offers 11.5s from the factory. Honestly, pick up one of those. They're better than um, cutting the barrel yourself. But so we've talked about the handguard and we've talked about the barrel. Now I want to talk about my laser solution and my general setup up here for night vision and white light because that's important. One huge benefit of the MCX platform is the fact that this top rail is fairly monolithic. Uh, LMT has a really cool monolithic rail design, and this is very similar to that. What that means is the rail is actually going to maintain zero with the upper, the, the upper right, it's not the rail isn't disconnected from this upper back here up to about this point. So if I have my laser back here, it is a extremely stable mounting platform. Um, it is never going to lose zero. In fact, I can take my ACOG or my ACOG, my EOTech, you could do an ACOG if you wanted, but I can take my EOTech and put it all the way up here and have a very stable uh, optic solution, which that actually has some benefits. Technically, I keep my optics further back, um, but over here, my LAM, which stands for Laser Aiming Module, I'm going to call it a LAM for the duration of this video, L-A-M, uh, isn't on this rear section, which will maintain zero very well. So instead, I have a Arasaka clamp right here. And I'll try to get you guys a better picture or a better zoom in. That clamp right there is essentially going to pass through and it's going to clamp this Midwest Industries rail. We're going to tighten it on this side uh, incredibly securely in. So if I put this between us, and I'm going to try and show you. You guys have seen all the drama around the MCX Spear LT having barrel uh, kind of deflection or barrel uh, movement when you when you try to do this little test. Look at, I am putting so much pressure into that, and it moved like a millimeter. Ugh. I'm a pretty strong dude, right? 470-pound uh, deadlift, 280-pound bench, you know? I'm a pretty strong dude, and I cannot pin that barrel to, like, the end of my handguard, which isn't the right word, but I, I can't move it to the end of my handguard like a spear LT. And then furthermore, when I stop doing it, it's going to recenter immediately. This is a very secure platform. It's not as secure as uh, like quad rail, like a 10-3 Mark 18 quad rail, the Daniel, Defis, uh, Daniel Defense Wrist 2, but it's, it's very stable, guys. Um, the MCX is a great platform for lasers, especially if you want to throw it back there, or if you have a shorter, like 9-inch 300 blackout, then of course your laser is going to go there because your barrel is going to be a lot lower. Now, at the front of this rifle, I have a LS420. That is a little bit different than what I had before. I used to have a LS321G. This is the LS420, which is very similar to that, but it also has white light capability. So if I take off both of these covers right here, you will see that this one is going to be the white light, and this one is going to be the laser illuminator and the laser uh, the laser itself, the IR laser, as well as the Viz laser, uh, which is really fun to play with your cat with. Um, this is uh, kind of not completely needed. I used to have the 321G, um, and I was doing a RMA with Hollow Sun. Uh, his name was Johnny. Johnny is like their lead customer service guy. Um, but I sent him a Roland special upper because I couldn't get like the optic off or something, and they lost it in the mail. And he said, well, we can't give you money, but we can send you a product. And I was like, I'll take an LS420. So what this is, is this is the LS420, which is different than the LE420. The LE420, I think, is made out of like titanium and is slightly more expensive. However, this is the LS420 LE model. So this is the one they sell to LE. Um, I think he mentioned it's slightly stronger. It's not full power, but it's also like more potted and it goes through a lot more testing. Like I know they like submerge this and everything before they send it out to people. So this is a really nice laser. Um, it's definitely not the best laser for this build. I think a really nice like Steiner unit or a full power Maul, as an example, would be much better because this is a civilian class laser. However, um, I do like that, first of all, it's made by Hollow Sun, which uh, Steiners have a knack for like prolapsing. And uh, Russian lasers, if they break, you, you're never going to be able to RMA those, right? This is made by Holosum that has a really nice RMA or just a warranty process. So if this breaks, I know I can get it taken care of. Um, and second of all, I kind of like the point that it has a flashlight built into it. Now, I have a ludicrously strong flashlight on the right side of my rifle. 
However, having a kind of backup light that pushes a good amount of lumens, uh, I think it's like less than 500, but it has a really nice flood to it. Um, it's not bad because, you know, stuff fails all the time. And having just like a backup light, uh, some people say it's not necessary, but it really doesn't add that much weight. Um, but LS420, I'll have a review in the future for you guys. Now, on the right side of my rifle, I have a weapon light, a Surefire, I think it's their M600, I'm not exactly sure, it came off my LMT, um, but I'm friends with the guy uh, over at HRT, and he works for Lone Star Weaponry, and he actually got me one of these kind of like beta uh, weapon light caps that I know they saw on the website now, um, and I think this is the one that has 90,000 candela. That is a ludicrously bright light, and I know this doesn't give you a great example, but I'm just going to shine it into the camera. That is a comically bright uh, uh, cap right here that I will be showing you guys more in the future because I am able to get proper PID out to like 200 yards with this thing if I want. It's very funny. Um, before we move forward, this is a light cap. Uh, it's not made by 100 Concepts. I will have a review of this light cap and this EOTech kill flash up here very soon. I got this for about $10, and so far it's been great. I'll tell you guys about it probably in two weeks. All right. Now, at the very, very front of the rifle, we have oh, sorry, we have a work hop. Now, this is a Surefire War Comp that I have not pinned to the rifle, but just placed on the rifle. Um, and you'll notice there's a camo paint job on it. I just recently repainted this rifle. Look at how nice that looks, right? If you don't paint your rifle, you are you're a loser, man. I'm sorry. Paint your rifles, guys. Don't worry about resale value. I'll put a meme on the screen right now. Uh, but this War Comp. The War Comp is, in my opinion, the best uh, muzzle device probably on the planet for like a general rifle if you're not running suppressed. Because the War Comp has incredible flash reduction, but it also has these ports right here and right here that you need to time yourself to make sure uh, if you're right handed or left handed. Um, but it is going to push the rifle a little bit down while you're shooting. So it makes a already very tame and heavy rifle even more tame. Um, I really like the War Comp and I recommend it. However, I am looking into getting this MCX suppressed very soon. And the War Comp isn't the best suppressor host. A three prong or four prong or even the break is going to do a lot better because there's no labyrinth seal on this. Um, so if you're running an unsuppressed rifle, the War Comp probably for you. Um, and even then, it's still great even if you are running suppressed, it's just not as good suppressed as the other options. So, War Comp. Now, let's move back and talk about what I have under my rail. And this is something that I'm constantly going back and forth on. Um, oh, and I have a uh, tape switch for my light and then my LAM, I just reach over. I don't run a tape switch for that. Uh, this is a, uh, I think it's a BCM grip, a BCM vertical grip that I have ankled forward. Um, you see these everywhere, and uh, I'm going to have a video at some point discussing grips and whether or not they're necessary, but for a really short package like this, I find that the grip can help me bring the rifle into my shoulder. Um, I can get a very stable like holding position on it, as well as it gives me a better way of actuating my lamb over here, right? That's my lamb button that's going to turn it on. Um, the downside of a grip is that if you are doing like barricade work or prone work, um, or if you're trying to, let's say my wall is an arm here, right? If you're trying to mount the rifle on a wall, uh, the grip can kind of get in the way. Um, so I kind of go back and forth. Um, your rifle build really dictates what you do. Uh, and what you do dictates your rifle build, right? See how that works? So if you are resting on a flat surface a lot, don't put a grip on your gun. But if you are doing maybe a little bit more mobile shooting, or if you're looking for a little more recoil reduction, et cetera, or if you just prefer grips, put a grip on your gun, guys. There's no, there's no answer for it. It's just whatever you're trying to do with the rifle. Video's live. Tom's flipping you off behind your head. Versus this, 
for longer range rifles, I would never put a grip on my gun because I'm going to be on the ground or I'm going to be resting against something a lot more, like a sandbag. Now, that's basically all I have to say about the grip, um, or the rail, rather, sling uh, holders. I really recommend these. They're really cheap from, like, T-Rex arms and whatnot. And now we are going to talk a little bit about this kill flash right here, and once again discuss the optics. Um, this kill flash I will be having a review on in the future. Kill flashes for... Uh, lower optics, like or A1X optic, uh, may not be the most necessary. Um, the purpose of a kill flash is if you are using your optic to uh, really observe your environment, a kill flash comes in handy. For something like an EOTech, it's not the most necessary. But once again, because I have this G45 back here, because I have this G45 back here, I can use this EOTech for a kind of scouting role if I need to, and it's still a 5X with very clear glass. So I think a kill flash is really up to you. Um, it's not completely necessary, but I don't mind it. Um, and that's about all I have to say on my optic setup because I will have more reviews of that on the future. in the future. Now let's talk about my lower. Uh, the lower is uh, not too much different than a normal Virtus. So this rifle is SBR'd, by the way, before any of you NFA commandos jump at me and ask me why I have a grip. Um, unfortunately, I gave the government my money to SBR this. It's about 200 bucks. Um, SBR stands for Short Barreled Rifle. Uh, I don't consider this an SBR because that would be kind of agreeing with the NFA and the ATF. Instead, I just call this a rifle with a short barrel. That's how I justify it. But this is an SBR rifle, so I am able to run a full stock, not just a pistol brace, as well as this grip. The only other things I have different about this lower is a, I have a Geisley trigger, which is about a $300 trigger. Um, and I have a non-ambidextrous, I think it is a Radian selector. And I'm going to speak to both of those right now because... The longer I've gone through my gun journey, the more I have started to enjoy stock firearms or just OEM. And I really don't think tinkering with them is really the best play. Um, now, when it comes to this Geisley trigger, this Geisley trigger is phenomenal. I'll give you guys a representation of that. I'm obviously clear, but watch this trigger. So it's a two-stage trigger, so we're going to take up the wall, which is right here, and then we're going to pull. It is, I'm just guessing, two to three pounds. It is a phenomenal trigger. Um, it is, by all metrics, a better trigger than the original MCX trigger. However, the original MCX trigger was already a better mil spec trigger. Um, so, once again, when we talk about uh, upgrading your guns, buying an optic is 100% a great idea. A lamb, a light, um, but the trigger and this selector, and I'm looking at the rifle right now, this war comp, even though I like the war comp a lot, I don't think you should waste your money on these upgrades, guys. I think you should spend your money on ammunition, and if you don't have a nice play carrier, go buy a play carrier. If you don't have nods, instead of buying $300 triggers, buy night vision like back there. Um, 
this is a great trigger. And if you have the extra money like I do to throw around and, and buy cool stuff, please buy it. It'll make you a better shooter because it's just going to kind of make your skills that you already have a little bit better because you're firing with a better trigger solution, right? A better firing solution. Um, however, use your money sparingly and use your money intelligently. Um, if I could do it all again, I don't think I'd upgrade this trigger because I just don't think it's completely necessary. The original trigger is pretty great. Uh, the Radiant Selector, if I could do it all over again, I definitely wouldn't get this Radiant Selector because it is just a little bit more mushy than I like. With a lot of AR triggers, when you, I'm trying to get you guys a good visual, but with a lot of AR triggers, when you do this, it's just going to snap into place. With this Radiant Trigger, I have to follow through. See how it just stays there? I have to follow through the entire duration of that safety to uh, get it to go into safe or fire. And I did that because I don't like ambidextrous safeties on rifles. Um, same thing with like 1911s and 2011s. 1911s are not that big of a deal, but ambidextrous safeties can kind of really mess up your other uh, firing hand. So what I mean by that is, you see where my hand is right here? If there was an ambidextrous safety right here, it would be kind of cutting into it. So ambidextrous safeties definitely have their place. Um, but once again, if I could redo everything, I would have just sucked it up and been a man and not change this. And I'll probably change it back in the future. Um, down here, I have the normal uh, MCX grip. It is perfectly grippy. It's been painted a million times. Your rifle doesn't need to be stippled or anything to get a good grip on it because it's a rifle. It's different than a pistol. Um, and other things of note are, first of all, this bad lever. Instead of being made by... Uh, Magpul, the Magpul bad lever. I think this is made by Parker Mountain Machine because it's just a slightly different design. And what a bad lever does, for those of you that don't know, because uh, many people don't like them, and those people are objectively wrong. What a bad lever does is it allows you to drop your bolt from inside the trigger well, right? So what that looks like is normally with an AR, you have to press this down while pulling your charging handle back. And that's a little bit weird because a lot of the time you need to like rest it against your leg or something. With a bad lever or this PMM lever, I am instead able to, do you see this little doohickey right here inside my trigger guard? Um, what you do is you push this up, right? And you hold it up. And sorry, my sling's in the way. And now if I pull back this charging handle, my bolt is locked to the rear. Okay, and now guess what happens if I push this down? It's going to slam my bolt forward. Okay, so it makes mag changes a little bit better. Uh, but honestly, I don't think that's the point of a bad lever. Uh, it is a it is a bonus. It can make your reloads a little bit faster. But the point of a bad lever is that I don't need to do this weird maneuver to pull my bolt back if I have like a malfunction or if I'm just if I need to pull my bolt back for whatever reason. Um, a bad lever or a bad lever type solution is going to go on every single rifle until I die. Now there's a lot of rifles out there nowadays that are coming with a bad lever type solution right about like here um, on the rifle. They'll find a good place for it because I think everyone's realizing just how beneficial it is. Um, the bad lever and the PMM version of it are phenomenal and they are 100% worth your money. I think this is probably about 100 bucks. Trigger, skip the trigger, skip the radian, skip the war comp, get a bad lever. It is 100% worth the money. Now, we're almost done, guys. Uh, above everything that I just showed you, we have a Radian Raptor charging handle. Um, a Radian Raptor charging handle just makes it a little bit easier to charge the weapon uh, for something like malfunctions or just charging the weapon for whatever you need to charge the weapon for. Um, it can defeat gases a little bit better than the mil spec, but the original MCX charging handle, repeat after me, is perfectly fine. 
okay? This was not worth the $100 to $200. Would I do it again? Maybe, because I like Radians on actually all of my rifles. The Radian charging handle is just the gold standard. However, if you're not pulling in six, I'm not even pulling in six figures, but if you're not pulling in six figures or you don't have the extra money to throw at this, or even if you're just money conscious and you're smarter with your money than I am, it's really not necessary. Just stay with what you have and it'll work perfectly fine. I'm filming. He's used to heavy compensation. Now, uh, the HRF Magwell, um, I am friends with one of the guys over at HRF, so, but I bought this before I knew him, so I can be a little bit unbiased. Uh, this is not super necessary. The MCX Magwell is perfectly adequate. It's a little bit flared out. This is significantly flared out. And the purpose of this is for faster, more consistent reloads, which is the most important part, because this isn't gonna make you faster, but it's just gonna make it a little bit more consistent. I'm going to show you guys what that looks like. So without even looking at my magwell, I can just throw that in. See how it kind of funnels my mag in? I'm, I'm going to look elsewhere. Right. So it does benefit reloads. However, the largest part to the HRF magwell is night vision. Once again, this is a night vision gun, clearly. EOTech, LAM, shorter barrel. Uh, on a massive riser, by the way, the Unity riser raises the optic, makes it so my tubes can get behind it easier. This is a night vision accessory because um, anyone and their grandmother can reload a AR-15 because it's not like you're reloading a 1911 or an MP5 where the magwell is really, really thin. You have to be very precise um, or even like a lot of Glocks. AR-15s normally have a nice flare to them. This is a massive flare, but when you're using night vision, everything is harder, okay? Um, when you are not able to cheat and look down at your magwell or just kind of see it out of the, your peripheral vision, everything is harder. And I don't struggle with reloads under night vision, but this makes it so I basically never miss. Because once again, night vision is just doing everything you do during the day, but just a couple times harder. That's it. That's all night vision is. It's not that much different. Anyone that tells you you need to take a class to be able to walk around night vision is a doofus. Don't listen to them. Okay. I'm going to get some hate for that. Now, the rear of the rifle, we're wrapping up here, guys. Uh, this is a 1913 stock uh, adapter. So SIG really did their homework with this, and they realized that this was kind of the superior mounting platform for stocks. And what I can do is if I push down and up on this knuckle, I can fold this stock and throw this into a bag very easily, okay? So... That is a great innovation of the MCX platform, the ability to transport it a little bit easier and shoot the weapon. It's different than a law folder. And I'm going to go on a quick tangent here because many people say that the MCX is overpriced, right? Um, and there was a fantastic T-Rex Arms video a couple days ago that I watched where they were discussing the law folder attachment for your rifle. What the law folder does is it allows you to make it so your AR-15 can be folded. Normally, that wouldn't be possible because of the buffer tube system, right? The MCX is using an AR-180 system. It doesn't need that buffer tube. Um, but this law folder makes it so your AR-15 won't be able to fire folded. It'll be able to fire once, I think, actually. But it'll be able to be folded. And the funny thing is is buying everything for that is going to be hundreds of dollars. The ability to fire your weapon folded and the ability to just fold your weapon is going to be, uh, I think they quoted between three and $500, depending on exactly what components you go with. And that's gonna take your mid-range $1,500 BCM, whatever rifle, into the $2,000 range. So at that point, MCX might make more sense for you guys. Uh, this is a sub MOA rifle. Um, back when I had a Vortex Razor HD Gen 2, as well as my ACOG, not as much anymore with my optic setup I have now, but I was able to get roughly one MOA, if not actually lower than one MOA groups with 10 round groups at 100 yards, uh, running 77 grain OTM, whether that be Mark 262, as well as IMI 77 grain, which is shocking for how cheap that ammo is. 55 grain, I'm running between one and two MOA. Anything worse than that is obviously going to balloon out. Steel is... Uh, 
five MOA, if I remember correctly, it's not good. Uh, but that's steel ammo. That's to be expected. Um, the MCX is well-deserving of your time. And now that I've gone through the entire setup of the rifle, it's time for me to get into opinions. Like I said, instead of buying a rifle that is that you're just going to dump money into, maybe buying an MCX is a better solution. The MCX comparison versus the Spear LT. My Virtus has no recoil. My Virtus uh, does have a different lower, which is going to only, it's not going to accept AR triggers. Um, however, I am able to use the new Spear LT upper. And there are benefits to the new Spear LT. Namely, the handguard is going to be thinner than the original MCX Virtus, as well as uh, it is going to be a lighter rifle, okay? That being said, the Virtus barrel contour, being as heavy as it is, is a massive benefit, as well as the Virtus being a uh, less expensive system at this point because it has been generationally outdone by, by the Spear LT. Uh, for those couple reasons, first of all, I love and recommend my Virtus. I see no point in moving up to a Spear LT. If I could start over today, maybe I'd grab an LT, like an 11.5. However, once again, I love the barrel contour of the Virtus. Furthermore, the stock that my friend's uh, Spear LT comes with, that new Kate Moss stock, I have uh, played with those quite a bit in the past on this Virtus build. Those are awful. I much prefer a standard buffer tube system that I can put AR stocks on. Um... The Virtus is, in my opinion, still well worth your money in 2024. Many people are going to overlook this platform because of the cost or because of the weight. Um, but I think the benefits on this system greatly outweigh the negatives. And I think if you are a AR aficionado, this still deserves a look. Now, a direct impingement rifle is going to run things a little bit differently, but a piston gun is going to be a cleaner rifle, especially when you're shooting suppressed. Um, and once again, it's going to have the benefits of being able to uh, close the stock and be able to fire. Now, I want to speak to suppressed use a little bit before we kind of close out this video. This video, this rifle, will be getting suppressed in the near future by either a I'm kind of stuck between an RC2, a Polonium, uh, maybe even a flow-through can. And one of the flaws of the MCX, I'm not really going to, maybe I shouldn't say it's a flaw, but one of the issues is that it is a little bit of a gassy system. Now, unsuppressed, you don't notice that gas whatsoever. So, uh, and if you are using SIG suppressors, I've heard they are fantastic. Great sound suppression and not as much gas pressure on your face. However, I have put a RC2 on this rifle and within about you know five rounds you're kind of getting gassed out if you're standing completely still you're going to have a little bit of gas in your eyes and gas in your face now online people will tell you the mcx virtus is disgustingly over gassed in fact i spoke with the uh owner of otter creek labs the other day and even he told me that the mcx is way over gassed and i'm not going to say they're wrong because they're not um, they know what they're talking about however i've shot a Mark 18 suppressed. I have shot a 12.5 suppressed, and I've shot a couple of 16-inch suppressed rifles. Uh, my buddy's Block 2, or my buddy's Mark 18 10.3. Um, as well as I've shot a lot of 300 blackout suppressed, and I really can't say that this is that much worse. Um, I wish it performed better. Normally, piston guns will actually suppress a little bit. First of all, cleaner, which this definitely does. Uh, my rifle looks almost perfect after 5,000 rounds compared to some of my other friends' rifles. Um, however, I wish suppressed it ran a little bit less gassy. And there's not many solutions for it because I don't have the capability of adjusting gas blocks or bolt carrier groups or even running a suppressed uh, SD charging handle. I don't think that exists. So... Um, the only things I'd really like to see that SIG change on the Virtus moving forward would be potentially having more gas settings and or making it so it's going to have a little bit less gas to the face. Adjust that port uh, and see if they can fix that issue because that really is one of the only things holding the rifle back. Um, the MCX is probably my favorite primary shooting implement that I've ever used. I have a lot of experience on AR-15s, uh, LMTs, um, 
piston guns, 300 blackout, 556, five, and everything in between. Even AKs I've started to get a little bit more use in. Um, and the MCX stands above them all as my favorite rifle I've realistically used. Obviously, I'm a little bit biased because it's my rifle, but once again, I still recommend that you give the Virtus a shot in the year 2024, and I'm very excited to see what SIG does with this rifle moving forward, okay? So there is going to be a lot more to come on this rifle. This video really was kind of a primer into me speaking about other topics, like namely me suppressing this, doing different optics set up, talking about the light cap and everything. Uh, I just wanted to give an updated review from my perspective over the past couple years. This rifle, guys, it's not going to make you a good shooter. You have to go out and train. Uh, if you don't go to the gym, you're not going to be able to hold a 10-pound unloaded rifle. That's another complaint. People complain it's really heavy. Go to the gym, guys. You know, I'd rather my rifle be lighter than heavier. But when you have all the capability that you have on this rifle, so a magnifier, EOTech, LAM, light, everything, yeah, the rifle is going to be heavy. Go to the gym, do your deadlifts, do your bicep curls, you know, get stronger, work on your own intelligence, work on your drills, and get proficient with these weapons because buying a $2,000 gun and putting four or $5,000 worth of attachments on it isn't going to do you any favors. And the amount of people I know and friends that I have that buy really expensive toys and never train in it whatsoever and put 100 rounds to the rifle in a year, it is infuriating. So please go out, please go out and train, make friends and, you know, develop those skill sets. Um, this has been Alex with Armadillo Armament. A lot more coming in the near future. I appreciate you guys making it to the very end of this video. I'll catch you guys in the next one.